Well, welcome to week five of our 2020 vision series. And uh, I'm standing, as Chris mentioned, I'm standing right here in the new auditorium at our Olathe campus. And we are so excited to have a facility and a place to meet. Uh, one of our staffers just told me just this morning that this past weekend, there were a couple people who came up and said, it is so nice to be in a, in a permanent space. And so for those of you who have uh, prayed for the Olathe campus, thank you for doing that. And if you happen to be in the Olathe area, we'd love to have you join us at some point. I would love to meet you. We'd love to have you, uh, have you show up at one of our services if you're in the area. So it's, uh, it's exciting to be here. Well, as I said, we are in week number five of our 2020 vision series. And this is really a series that's been in two parts. The first three weeks, we talked about the what, which is the vision of grace. And so say it with me right there from your home. What's the vision of grace? help everyone become an outward focused follower of Jesus. We talk about it a lot. And for the past, for the first three weeks of the series, we talked about it from back to front and unpacked it. What's a follower of Jesus the first weekend? It's really a disciple. That's a follower of Jesus. But at Grace, we want to produce a particular kind of follower of Jesus, which is an outward focused follower. So becoming outward focused, it's really the great commandment. To, to love God and to love others as ourselves. And if you're anything like me, it requires some intentionality for me to think about other people. It's pretty intuitive and pretty natural for me to say, what's this mean for me? How is this gonna affect me? But becoming outward focused is the middle portion of our vision statement. And then a couple of weeks ago, we talked about helping everyone. That's what we wanna do, help everyone become a follower of Jesus Christ, each of us doing our part. And now we're in the second section of the series, talking about the how. How do we go about doing this? How do we create followers of Jesus? And we've introduced a, uh, a growth path. We've been talking about a growth path, and it has three parts. Connect to grace, grow in Jesus, and go make disciples. And this week, we're talking about grow in Jesus and what that looks like, how to do it, how to go about doing it. And so, let me ask this question. Have you ever thought about what it takes to grow something? What does it take to grow something? Well, it probably depends on what we want to grow. So if I want to grow a business, then I need to have a business plan. I need to have sales people. I need to have uh, the, the marketing that needs to go in place. But that's a different thing entirely than growing a garden. If I want to grow a garden or some plants, I need some water, I probably need some seeds to start with, or a plant to start with, a sunshine. It's a different set of things. But what does it take to grow a follower of Jesus? How do we do it? What does it need? You know, as we talk about growing things, one of the things that are, that, that, that's true is that there are some universal things. If we want to grow something, it usually requires that we create the right environment. It oftentimes requires that we develop a plan. We have to have a plan. We need to be intentional about growing something if we want to grow it. But it's also true that if I don't have a plan, I might grow something. It just may not be what I want to grow. For instance, if I don't have a plan to brush my teeth, I'm probably going to grow some plaque, right? Or if I don't have a plan to eat healthy, I'm probably going to grow just not in the ways that I want to grow. Or, help me, what happens if we don't have a plan to clean out the refrigerator? What do we grow? Say it with me. Mold. That's right. We grow mold if we don't have a plan to clean out the refrigerator. So this whole idea of growing as a follower of Jesus, to grow in Jesus is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to spend some time talking about why is it even important? Why grow in Jesus? And then we'll spend some time talking about how do we even do it? How do we grow in Jesus? Some resources, some practical tips about how to do it. And then how do we help other people grow in Jesus? So if you'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, we're going to start reading in verse 11 in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to pray. And we'll ask God to be here in our time together and teach us what he wants us to learn. Father, we, we do thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the fact that you died for us to have a relationship with us. Thank you for the fact that you even want us to grow closer to you, to grow more like you. And Lord, we specifically ask that today, 
you would speak to each of us from wherever we may be, from whatever state we may be living, that you would speak to us, that you'd help me to stay out of the way, that you would give me the exact words to say for those who are gonna be hearing, that you would speak and your Holy Spirit would be glorified and honored, and that when we leave this, this time, that we're different because we've heard from the, the creator of the universe. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, as I mentioned, we'll read this. Start off in verse 11, Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus and he says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So God gave certain roles to the church. And in verse 12, he says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, edifying is just to build up or, or to, to benefit, to strengthen, to instruct. For the edifying of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is just another word or another way to say the church. Sometimes you may hear it referred to as the bride of Christ or the body of Christ. Just different ways to say the church. That's what Paul is talking about here. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint uh, supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now there's a variety of things that are in this passage. There's a lot here. So let's talk through walk through what it is that we can learn about. Why in the world is it important for us to even grow in Jesus? The first thing we see is in verse 13. Growth in Jesus produces unity. Growth in Jesus produces unity. Now, it produces unity of the faith, but it produces unity. And if there's something that our world needs, if it's something that our country needs right now, it's this thing, unity. And you see, growing closer to Jesus Christ as we grow together toward Jesus, unity is produced. You know, as I was thinking about this, this idea, I was reminded of an illustration that we'll often use in premarital mentoring or in marriage counseling. And it's this idea, you see it on the screen there, this idea of a triangle, where at the top is Jesus, the top of the triangle. And on either side, on the bottom two corners of the triangle, is a person. It may represent, one of them represents you, and the other one could represent your spouse, a friend, someone else in the church body, or anyone else. And as we grow closer to Jesus, what happens to those two people? They go, grow closer together. You see, unity begins to happen because they're going the same direction, they're going after the same thing, and as you and I grow in Jesus, it produces unity in us. Now, does that mean that we all agree on every point? Does that mean we agree? About, no, it doesn't mean we agree on everything. But it means that we're going the same direction. We've got unity of faith. We have unity so that those, those smaller things that aren't gonna matter for eternity, when they bubble up, that we disagree on, it's okay. Because we're unified around Jesus. Because we're growing in Jesus. So growth in Jesus produces unity for us. Paul goes on and in verse 13, he gives us another thing, that gr growth makes us more like Jesus. It makes us more like Jesus because he says, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, as we grow, we learn who Jesus is more and more. And then he goes on and he says, to a perfect man. Now, I'm not sure about you, but my wife will tell you I'm not perfect. I tend to argue with her, but she disagrees. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. The only one who's perfect is Jesus. But let's look at this next phrase. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, as we grow in Jesus and we become more like him, what happens is not perfection 
We'll not get that until we reach eternity, until we get to heaven. But what happens is we become a measure of the stature of Jesus. That this week, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an inch the measure of Jesus. Next week, next year, I'm an inch and a half. Or we become more like Jesus as we grow in Jesus. And here's the benefit that that happens, has. You see, Jesus is love. Jesus is, is peace. He's long suffering. And as I become more like him, you know what happens in my life? I gain more peace. As I become more like him, I become more long suffering for those, with those around me. You see, growing in Jesus makes me more like him. And when I become more like him, I become better. I get those things that I like, those things that I want in my life that are helpful to me. More peace, more love, more long suffering because that's who Jesus is. So growth makes us more like Jesus. We also see in verse 14 that growth is natural. It's natural. Paul says, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, tossed here and there about every wind of doctrine. You see, one of the things that is true about kids is that kids tend to believe things that are not true. I, I was a kids pastor for a, a long time here at Grace. And kids can sometimes believe things that aren't true. You know what? I am, I am 12 feet nine. Really? Well, that's not true. And what happens is as we grow in Jesus, it's a natural thing when we grow. And it makes us know what to believe and what not to believe. It's a natural process. What happens when your kids don't grow? What do we do? Well, we go to the doctor, don't we? Hey doc, there's something wrong. Help me know why my child isn't growing. You see, growth is a natural outcome and it's a natural thing that's expected of us. And when we grow, it gives us direction. When we grow, that peace that we just talked about comes into our lives. It gives us that peace. It gives us security. We're not looking around, for the, around the world for the security that could be here that's only temporary. But growing in Jesus gives us security for eternal things, security forever. So growth is natural. And this isn't I'm not talking about physical growth here. We're talking about, about spiritual growth, growth that impacts eternity, growth that impacts things that are way down the road that are not ever going to end. That's what we're talking about here. You see, growing in Jesus helps us impact eternity. It helps us change the very face of eternity. So how about you? We're talking about the reasons to grow in Jesus. We're talking about what it, what it, what, why do it? So are you growing in Jesus? Are you, are you growing? If you're not growing in Jesus, what are you growing? If you don't have a plan to grow in Jesus, what are, what are you growing? Something's probably growing. The question is, do I want it or not? So that's some of the why behind growing in Jesus. Why do it? Now let's talk about how do we do it? How do we go about doing that? That's great. I should grow in Jesus. I got it. I'm good. How do I go about doing it? So turn with me to, first, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1. Let's pick it up in verse 5. 2 Peter 1, 5. Peter says here, but also for this very reason. Now Peter's going to go through a list of things here to add to our faith. So hang with me, okay? For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I read that list and I think I'm tired already. I'm, I'll, never, I'll never get there, right? I'm supposed to add all those things? Well, here's the, here's the, here's the crazy thing. Some, some scholars look at that list and they say it's a, it's a progression that you have to start with faith, then you do virtue, then you add knowledge. It has to be one after the other. Other scholars say, no, no, 
Peter was just using a literary tool to talk about what we, how we need to grow. I tend to think it's both and. Because we have to start with faith. We start with our faith in Jesus. That's where we begin. But then we grow from there and add different things to our lives. You're different than I am. What you may need to add today could look very different than what I need to add. Or what you need to add after faith is different than what I may need to add after faith or after virtue or after knowledge. You see, our walk with Jesus is customized. Our growth in Jesus is customized because each of us are different. Just like this tomato plant may need a little more water than that tomato plant. Or this business may need something different than that business in different orders. I tend to think that's a little more like it is. So verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what happens when we grow and we're adding things to our faith, it gives us meaning to our life. It's not pointless. Have you ever felt like, why in the world? What am I doing? I'm just going through the motions. What is going on here? When we're growing in Jesus, it takes that away. It gives meaning to our life. For he, verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted or nearsighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You see, when we're not growing in Jesus, the impact is that we become nearsighted. Nearsighted both directions. Nearsighted in that I don't remember my salvation. I don't remember that day that I said to Jesus Christ, I can't get to heaven on my own. I need you. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. We forgot what he did. We forget. Then we also can't see eternity. You see, we become nearsighted. If we're not growing in Jesus, I, I can't see past my face. I can't see eternity. I can't see the impact that I can have in eternity. So let's talk about what we can learn from this passage as to how to grow. How do we grow in Jesus? So first of all, we see in verse one that to grow in Jesus, we need to be diligent. To grow in Jesus, we need to be diligent. Now, Peter talks about this. He says, giving all diligence. Diligence. Now, what, that's, that's another word to say zeal or excited fervor. We, we may say passion. With passion, add to these things. He says, stay on task, stay focused, be excited about it. Do it with passion. I once, I once heard somebody define this idea of passion as that thing that you'll do until you're out of breath. Think about that for a minute. That thing that you'll do until you're out of breath. What is that? What is the thing that you think about all the time? What's the thing that you love to do until you're just, you're just out of energy? Now, for me, it's my bicycle. I, I love biking. And when someone says they're biking or someone brings up bicycling, I'm like, my ears are, are, are perked. I'm like, what? Oh, let's talk about this. And I, I love doing it. But I've got to have a plan for it. I've got to, all these things. I, I've grown in my cycling. But I love to do it. And I'll do it until I'm tired. A few years ago, somebody pulled me into this long distance endurance biking. And riding distances I never dreamed I'd ride. But I do it because I love it and I have a passion about it. So what Peter's saying here in 2 Peter, grow in Jesus with that same kind of passion. He's saying, Brian, the thing that you love to do, the thing that you'll think about, the thing that you'll, that you'll do until you're out of breath, grow in Jesus like that. That's what he's asking that's what he's saying. So to grow in Jesus, we've got to be diligent. Peter says, be passionate about it. Do it with passion. Do it with excitement. Do it with fervor. Verse 1 also tells us that to grow in Jesus, we need a plan. We need a plan. You see, Peter talks about adding. Add this. Add that. Add. It requires some intentionality. And to be intentional, 
we have to plan. We've got to put something down, something in place. Now there's an example of a plan over in, in Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Paul's talking to young Timothy, a pastor at the time, and he says this in verse 13. He says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He says, Timothy, until I get there, I want you to pay attention to reading. Now, a lot of people in biblical times did not have their own copy of the scriptures. So they, it was very important. So Paul said, you give attention to reading, to exhortation, to, to public encouragement, and to doctrine. You teach. Teach what you're reading. Teach it to others. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that's in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Now, Paul was speaking to Timothy and talking about how to run a, a corporate worship service. Timothy was a young pastor. But every one of the things that Paul tells Timothy to do, those can be applied to our own life. In our own life. Because verse 15, Paul shifts to talk about spiritual growth. And he says to Timothy, meditate on these things. Well, meditate on what things? Reading, exhortation, encouraging others, and doctrine, teaching. Meditate on these things. You want a plan? That's the plan. You see, meditating on God's word doesn't happen unless we're reading it. We have to, we have to read it our personal time with him every day to say, God, what is it that you have for me today? What do you want from me today? Give attention every day to reading and then give attention every day to encouraging other people. And here's the irony. You see, when we're growing in Jesus, it automatically encourages others. That's what happens. And the natural thing is that we want to begin to teach other people. Paul tells Timothy, I want you to meditate every day. And then he says, give yourself entirely to them. When I read that section, when I read that phrase, I thought, give myself entirely to them. Oh my goodness. I, I, I'm not sure if, if, if you can relate to this, but life has been crazy. In July, we had a flood in our house, a water line broke. I'm still dealing with all of that. We have four kids. We've been trying to get the Olathe campus up and running. I mean, all kinds of stuff going on. Now, my version is just a different version than yours. If you're anything like most of us, there is a lot going on in our world. And so we, I think, how in the world can I give myself entirely to anything? You know how I give myself entirely to, to growing in Jesus? Through passion, through diligence. And Paul says to Timothy, I want you to meditate. I want you to meditate on it. So what do I meditate on? I meditate on the scripture. And as I, as I clear off that time to read God's word, and I get this and that, and I write it down on a note card. Make a note in your phone and carry it with you. And all day, you're just thinking about it. Have you ever had something throughout the day that's just always with you? It could be a positive thing. It could be a negative thing. But all day, you, you go to work and you're listening. And it's there. You go, you go to lunch and there's that thought again. You, you go home, you go to bed. It's all right there. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. I want you to meditate on it. It's always right there and give yourself entirely to these things. That's what you're about. That you'll do it until you're out of breath. That you'll grow in Jesus until you're out of breath. So how do I grow in Jesus? How do I grow in Jesus? Well, first of all, develop a plan. That's what we've talked about. Develop a plan. Decide how you're going to read, where you're going to read. Ownit365.com is a great resource. It's a great tool. Decide where you're going to sit when you read. When are you going to read? Make a plan. If we don't have a plan, it's really, really hard to stay on track. It's really hard to grow. Meditate on the scripture throughout the day. Encourage other people. 
you know, I told you I love to bike. Well, there was a point in time where I'm, I'm biking, I'm growing, I've got my plan, I know when I'm going to get up and when I'm going to bike, how far am I going to go? And at one point I thought, I'd really love my wife to come bike with me. And so we got her a bike. Uh, she wasn't nearly as excited, nor did she have the zeal for it that I did. But, but she still joined me, right? And I, I brought her along. It's encouraging other people. Maybe the next step for you is to join a grace group. Maybe you need to join a grace study. Maybe you need to lead a grace study or a grace group. Go to visitgracechurch.com slash next steps. And look at the, the Grow in Jesus section and see what's out there. What, what groups are there? What studies are there? Maybe that's your next step. For some of you, maybe your next step is to, is to, 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 to grow by teaching other people how to grow. That's your next step. So it takes us to our third point. How do I help others grow in Jesus? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul writes this. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Imitate me. Paul in one verse boils down this whole idea of discipleship and how do we help other people grow? Well, we do it by saying, you know what, would you come alongside me and just follow me as I follow God? If you see me doing this, then do it. That's discipleship. It's coming alongside others and saying, Follow me, imitate me. I remember when our oldest son, when we brought him home from the hospital, processing all of that and thinking, the stakes have just been, just been raised because this little person is now gonna be watching me. He's gonna be doing what I do. He's gonna be acting the way I act. And boy, it raised the stakes on me. And when, when that happens in our lives, it raises the stakes. It's like, oh, I'm helping other people grow it means I need to stay on track. I need to have my plan in place. I need, to stay, I need to stay focused on it. I need to do it with zeal, with passion, with diligence. Remember we started in Ephesians chapter four. I wanna read verse 16. It says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working. What's effective working? Well, effective working is defined in the next phrase, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, the body works effectively because everybody does its share. And when you're growing and I'm growing and the rest of the body is growing in Jesus, what happens is we encourage each other to grow and the body grows. But if we're not working effectively, things atrophy, things don't grow. What happens if you sprain your ankle? Well, if you sprain your ankle and you can't walk on your ankle, that impacts your leg. Your leg atrophies, it gets weak because you can't use it. That happens in the body also, in the body of Christ. That if, if, if someone's not doing their part, if someone's not growing in Jesus, it, it impacts the rest of the body and it's not working effectively. And you may be listening and have gone through a time when you were hurt by an ineffective church body. Maybe you were wounded or hurt by grace. Let me just say I'm sorry. That was not God's design. But you know the amazing thing about the body and the amazing thing about the body of Christ is that it heals. It will heal. And if you stay as part of the body, it heals. Over time, the ankle heals, the leg heals. That's the amazing thing about the body of Christ. So let me ask you, what is your next step to grow? What's your next step? Maybe you need to develop a plan to read. Maybe you need to decide where you're gonna read, what you're gonna read. Check out ownit365.com. Maybe you need, to, you need to join a group or join a study or lead a group or lead a study. Or, or maybe your next growth step is to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You've never come to a point where you've said, I believe that Jesus died for me. I want him to be my Lord and Savior and ask him to come into your heart and save you. If that's you, would you please not, not wait another day? And if you're a follower of Jesus, decide what God wants your next step to be. And right now, would you just wherever you are, 
Say, God, what is my next step? Just ask him and listen to what he has to say. And whatever he says to you, tell him, I'll go do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for who you are. Lord, thank you for the fact that you want us to grow in you. And Lord, I pray that you would do in our hearts and in our lives what it is that you want done. That we passionately and with diligence follow you and take those next steps that you want us to take. In Jesus' name, amen.